So the goals for the series, just very quickly, some of you know and just uh, and some of you don't. So they're threefold. One, in terms of our faculty, we really want to promote our faculty and the great work that we do here at the University of Guelph. For our graduate students, we really want to increase the networking opportunities that you have and really strengthen our graduate programs and the opportunities that graduate students have here at the University of Guelph. And then the third is for our undergraduate students, many of whom I see here. Um, what we really want to do is we want to attract you. We want to attract the best and the brightest to work in cardiovascular or health sciences uh, research and also kind of support your career and lead to things that will really benefit you, whether that means that you're going to go into academia or government or industry, veterinary medicine, you know, human medicine, and things like that. These are kind of connections that can help you. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Love and Sherry to come up. They're uh, two of our student executive representatives, and they represent the two labs that are speaking today, and they're going to come say a few words. Um, so on behalf of the Student Executive Council and as members of the Dawson and O'Sullivan Labs, we welcome you to today's Center for Cardiovascular Investigations, Cardiovascular Scientists Seminars. So just a few notes, um, a special thanks to all members of the Student Executive Council for helping to coordinate their labs and for promoting today's event. And please do yes, take photos, tweet photos, use hashtags including hashtag Guelph, hashtag CCVI and any related sites. And importantly, we ask that people should remain for both speakers. Uh, let's hold questions until afterwards. You're welcome to come down and ask any questions at the end. Now we can have both talks in the time permitted. And also thank you to Biomed, OVC, and CBS for sponsoring the pizza lunch for today's seminar. Uh, we now have the honor of calling on Dr. Jonathan Newman, Dean of CBS, to say a few words to introduce our speakers. This one as well, double mics, okay. Uh, welcome everyone, it's great to see such a crowd. In fact, I feel, I feel somewhat bad taking up a seat uh, where you're all you know, crammed in here as I'm not a cardiovascular researcher. I, I really came to see what John does. Not that I'm not interested in what Lynn does as well, but <laughs> John is mine, so. <laughs> um, so I, you know, I was gonna come spy on him, basically, is what my plan was, and then Tammy asked me if I would introduce, so. Um, so here I am. Uh, so my pleasure first to introduce uh, Dr. John Dawson. He is a professor in the Department of uh, Molecular and Cellular Biology. And in addition to being a cardiovascular researcher, he is, also has a special interest in, uh, in pedagogy and the scholarship of learning and teaching. Uh, he is the founding director of the College of Biological Sciences Office of Educational Scholarship and Practice or co-ESP as we call it in the college. Uh, he started that position on the 1st of March. Um, well, it's been the 1st of March last year, yeah. Um, congratulations, anniversary. Um, John uh, started off life uh, as a double major in both biology and chemistry at Laurier. And then he went on to do a PhD in biochemistry. Why didn't you do two PhDs? Yeah, music was what I thought. Was it? Uh, PhD in biochemistry at the University of Alberta uh, at Edmonton, and then he went on did a postdoc at uh, in biochemistry at Stanford before joining Guelph in 2002. Uh, he is one of the founders of this uh, Center of Cardiovascular Investigations, and in 2006 he was awarded the first Heart and Stroke New Investigator Award to a professor at Guelph. That was just last year, and he was one of. 10 national winners of the inaugural CP Rail Has Heart, Heart and Stroke Foundation Cardiovascular Research Awards. That is a mouthful. Uh, John's talk is Cardiac Actin Mutations in Cardiomyopathy from Molecules to Organisms. Hopefully I pronounced those words correctly. Yeah. I'm just gonna yell and uh, we'll go from there. So yeah, uh, I want to be respectful of all of our time, and so I've got a five-minute talk prepared for you today, <laughs> and uh, we'll get going. So 
today I, my talk is in essentially three re research parts and one promotion part because in addition to all these other things, I'm also the captain of Guelph's Ride for Heart team. Here's my jersey from two years ago. So I'm going to at the end tell you all about that and say, join the team, it's a lot of fun, you'll love it. But let's get going and talk about some science here. I probably should stand over here. So I don't think I need to remind this audience that cardiovascular disease is the number one killer in the world and that cardiomyopathies are a group of diseases that contribute to heart disease and heart failure. And there's two types that I'll touch on today, uh, hypertrophic here and dilated. Hypertrophic where you have a thickened left ventricular wall and dilated where that's thinned and then I'll leave it all to Lynn to tell us all about dilated cardiomyopathy. And that's about as far as I'm going to go there. But for you, you also recognize that the core of this contraction is two proteins, actin and myosin, doing the contracting uh, in all of your muscles. And so that consists of those two parts, a motor protein, the myosin. Oh, wrong way. That's like this train. And then the track protein, the actin, um, that the motor runs on. And so um, if you're in this field, you recognize that myosin really is the star, right? It gets all the play. Actin is taken for granted and I go and I cry and all those wonderful things. But it makes sense because, you know, myosin is really exciting. There's all sorts of different types of myosin. You have these standard classic myosin that's in your muscle. And then more recently in the last 20 years or so, we've discovered new types of myosin, the exciting ones, right? The ones that can walk forward and take, we have, there's one type that can walk backwards. There's some that are anchors in your ear. They're the ones that are actually um, measuring the force of the sound waves so you can hear. So without that myosin, you're deaf. So myosin's exciting. Um, when I pulled these couple of pictures off the internet to illustrate this point about how exciting myosin is, my daughter standing over my shoulder said, yeah, dad, but you notice that both of these pictures have exactly the same track? The track hasn't changed. It's a great analogy. <coughs> We're still running our same trains on the same 100 and whatever year old tracks in Canada and in Europe. And the same is true molecularly. We take actin for granted because it doesn't change. It's a rock. It does not change. So your actin in your cells, if you took some actin from yeast, the stuff that makes your beer and your bread, it's 88% identical, identical. And then if I add in the substitutions that are conserved, you know, serine for three and those kind of things, yeast actin and your actin are 93% similar. This is a protein that does not change. So why is that? Why doesn't actin change? Well, the main message around actin is that it is a hub protein. It's got a host of protein interactions that interact with it. There's 160 known actin binding proteins. And a lot of these proteins are involved in every major physiological process in life. And so the selection pressure on actin in its sequence is so high that over the course of time, it simply has not changed. And so, yeah, we take it for granted. And I guess that's fair enough that it gets takes, taken for granted. It's just that important. Have I convinced you it's the most important protein ever? That's my job. That's what I have to do. Okay, good. So any talk from my lab would not be complete without going through the structure of actin. So here is a structure of actin. Here's the monomer. And it consists of two domains, a small domain and a large domain. And then in the middle, we have a hinge, these two helices. There's one here and one here. And they basically cross over. In the lab, we'll take our two, two hands and we'll do this. There's your actin structure and there's your two helices, right? And in the middle of those two helices on the bottom, is a nucleotide binding cleft where ATP or ADP is bound and it's holding these two guys together. If that nucleotide falls out, the structure falls apart and it's not functional anymore. So you got your nucleotide binding cleft and then down at the bottom, we've got a hydrophobic cleft right here where there's a lot of binding interactions and there's another really cool domain in actin up here called the DNA's one binding loop. This is an IDD. Uh, 
intrinsically disordered domain. It can adopt all sorts of really crazy structures. And one of the most important structures that it uh, can form is a, an alpha helix. And then that alpha helix, if it finds another actin, will insert right here. And then they start to form chains. This is what actin does. That's why it hasn't changed. It's this property to form polymers that your cells need and have taken advantage of for billions of years. So we've got a protein now that probably didn't start out as a muscle protein. Let's, let's be clear. It started out as a simple protein that could form polymers. And then the cells realized, hey, if we can tame that activity, if we can exploit that activity and make these polymers form and break down in a controlled way at the right place at the right time, we can control the cell. We can get it to move. We can migrate it just simply by polymerizing actin in the right place. Or we can get the cell to divide by forming a contractile ring. And so that's what cells have done. They've exploited and tamed this power of actin to form polymers. Because by itself, when you purify actin, it does this. It forms beautiful polymers like these that you see on an electron micrograph. And if you zoom in, you can see a single polymer and you can start to point out the individual actin monomers here and here. You can see them on an EM. And by the way, this picture here was taken by my postdoctoral supervisor in 1968, um, that was before I was born. <laughs> All right, so I'm I'm really young. Yeah, um, and now here's the helical reconstruction where you can see the individual actin monomers. So this is what actin does: it forms polymers, uh, and that's what we want to look at as well. So why is actin now so important for cardiovascular disease and cardiomyopathy? Well. It turns out that actin was the first gene, cardiac actin, the first gene identified where you had different mutations in the same gene, the cardiac actin gene, that were in patients that had different heart diseases. It broke the paradigm, and this was in the late uh, 1990s. And now, given what you know about actin, it makes sense, right? So you could have, because it's a hub protein, you've got, you could change some interactions with proteins that interact on this site, and that leads to one disease change the surface over here, it changes interactions with a different subset of interacting proteins and leads to a different disease. So this is the complex problem that our lab is trying to sort out. So what we have here is um, on top of that structure, all of the different mutations in actin, the sites of mutations found in patients with HCM, hypertrophic in black, and DCM in red. And you can see they're spread out over the surface of the molecule. They're not all in just one place. Although you can find there's a couple of different clusters. There's one right here, this cluster here. This is where we think myosin binds. And then there's another strip that's really important for Evan in the lab, and this is a strip that runs along here. Because that's where tropomyosin binds and does some regulation. Now, if you remember about tropomyosin, it's going to change its location, right? It's going to block the myosin binding site, and then it's going to move out. So here's where it's sitting when a myosin is active, and then it'll shift over and be sort of over here. So these mutations up in here might also be affecting tropomyosin binding. Good? So that leads to the global hypothesis for the lab, and that is simply that the location of the changes on the actin protein now impact different protein interactions leading to these different disease states. And that's what we want to understand. So how do we test that hypothesis? Well, we have these two ends of the spectrum. So we start down here with purified proteins and we're going to do enzyme activities down there. So I'm an actin guy, so the world for me is all based on actin, the actocentric world. So we'll start there and then uh, do our enzyme assays, and at the other end of the spectrum, we want to develop a model, a disease model in an organism. So we're going to use zebrafish out here in the organism, and we're hoping we can meet in the middle. So we have a physiology happening at the organism level and a molecular change at the protein level, and hopefully understand what's going on. And in, in the middle, I've grayed over, we also do reconstituted myofiber work. I've graded that out because I'm not going to show you the data today, but that's work done with Masataka Kawai at the University of Iowa. Okay? 
So here endeth the first part. And we'll get into the second part around protein work. And then I'll talk about zebrafish. Well, if you're going to do protein work, you need to know how to purify proteins. So in the lab, we go across the way to the meat lab and get fresh bovine hearts and then purify their cardiac actin. It's 100% the same as yours, the cardiac troponin and tropomyosin for our work. And then the standard in the field for myosin for many years has been rabbit myosin. And so we use the soleus muscle myosin. You could argue about, well, is that really cardiac or not? It turns out that the isoform um, mix in the soleus muscle of a rabbit does match pretty closely to human cardiac myosin uh, isoform mix. And that's, again, it's the standard in the field, so we can compare our results. Our claim to fame, though, here at Guelph is that there's only two actin labs, or two labs in the world that can make recombinant actin proteins, human cardiac actin proteins. So if we want to make those mutants, we have to make them recombinantly because most people don't want to give you their heart to purify the protein out of it. They're kind of using it at the time, kind of like a Monty Python skit. Still using it. Um, so there's us here at Guelph, and there's another lab here in Germany that can do this. So there's only two labs in the world. So we're one of them. There's also a third lab in Vermont. They used to uh, do some cardiac actin work, and now they've shifted their focus to skeletal actin. And so what we do is we infect insect cells with baculoviruses, recombinant baculoviruses. Thank you, Peter Krell, for coming today. Peter, I, I couldn't do this without Peter. He's a baculovirus guy. He studies baculovirus for the sake of baculovirus, and so wonderful resource. Wouldn't be able to do this without you. Um, but within about 24 hours of harvesting these cells, in the last three years, we've come up with a, a wonderful affinity chromatography uh, technique. So 24 hours later, you're looking at a massive band on a gel, pure human cardiac actin. So great, we've got our proteins, and now we can start to study some specific questions. And one of those is related to actin, actin and myosin. And so again, to remind you, there were these, that cluster of mutations that are in the myosin binding site. And essentially, we figure those are messing up the actin-myosin interaction, so we should be able to measure that. And so we use a couple of assays to do that and a couple of variations of them. One is the myosin ATPase assay, uh, which we can do with just naked actin. It's got no regulatory proteins. And you can make Michaelis-Menten curves. Please don't start screaming and running from the room. This is good old biochemistry. So we're using a standard amount of myosin. We increase the concentration of the substrate. Remember all this stuff? And then you get your activity measure here. And you can, from these curves, get your Vmax, your KM, all that wonderful things. And we can back calculate all sorts of interesting biophysical parameters that we won't talk about today, lest you really start screaming. So, um, but what you can see from this data, and this is data generated, by the way, by a fourth year project student. Uh, Despite the fact that all of these mutations we're talking about are in that same location on the actin molecule, the response is different for all of them. We figured they'd all be kind of the same, but they're not. So there's one assay. Another kind of assay is using a variant is using the same ATPase assay, but now doing a PCA curve. So PCA, as you remember, it's like the negative log of the concentration of calcium. So a PCA of 10 is really low amount of calcium, 10 to the minus 10 molar. And then 4 is really high, relatively speaking. So in the presence of regulated thin filaments, those that have troponin and tropomyosin, we can see the response of the uh, myosin as it binds and has its activity. And you can get uh, PCA50 values. And we also plot these uh, by the absolute activity, not relative activity. You'll commonly see that. Let's say, you know, percentage of maximum. And we don't do that. We actually do an absolute. So we can see things like this where the E99K mutant has a lower maximum activity, even when they're regulated thin filaments. So just a snapshot of what we can do with those assays. Another really cool assay is the in vitro motility assay. And this is where you take uh, myosin and you coat a, a cover slip with myosin. It creates kind of like a shag carpet of myosin heads. And you flow in these fluorescent actin filaments. So on the screen here, each one of these little strings is an individual actin filament. Remember the EM picture? Two molecules wide. That's what you're seeing. 
And then you put in the fuel, ATP, and the myosin grabs onto the actin and pulls it. And basically the actin starts to translocate along the surface as myosin pulls on it. So at a PCA of 10, if we use regulated thin filaments, <coughs> try and get out of the way so you can see. Remember PCA 10, regulated thin filaments, not a lot of calcium around, so you don't expect to see any actin or myosin activity. Let's see. Here, there you go. It, the movie is actually running, and all we see is just sort of Brownian motion, right? But on the other side, if we go to PCA of 4.5, that's when we had maximal myosin activity, right? And so you'd expect to see something happen. You ready? So you got to really watch. So um, at a PCA of 4.5, boom, and they just start cruising. And so now what Hayden did, who's the master student doing this work, he went painstakingly frame by frame, measuring each individual filament, measuring its displacement frame by frame. And then you can calculate the velocity. Right? Displacement over time. And it turns out then at each PCA value, you can plot the velocity that you generate versus the PCA and you get those same response curves. And what you can see from these response curves is the wild type is in green and the two variants here are the colors. You're actually seeing a shift in the PCA. These curves are shifted to the right, which means they are less sensitive to calcium. They need more calcium to get the same response. That suggests a, a pathology mechanism. All right, so that's what we do with pro pure proteins. We're just giving you the, you know, the, the highlights here today. And so essentially with this, we're seeing different molecular changes with the naked filaments, but when we move to the RTFs, the regulated thin filaments, we start to see lower calcium sensitivity, which might lead to hypocontractility, and then the question is, are those regulatory proteins, when they're present, are they actually helping take account for any of these specific actin myosin defects? Are they actually adding to the glue that's holding it all together and then compensating for specific defects? Um, and is there then a common pathway as part of that compensatory mechanism that leads to disease? Because if you're compensating, there's got to be a cost for that. And it's a minor cost, but in humans, after 30, 40, 50 years of that, it starts to wear things down. And then does that what lead to the uh, eventual disease um, that you see? And that's part two. Okay. So now we're going to talk about the other end of the spectrum over here. It's the, the, the model that we want to develop. And we're going to use zebrafish to look at these actin mutations and how they um, are contribute to disease. So zebrafish are wonderful for heart research. And I know a lot of you use mice. I understand that. I can't. Too expensive. Um, so, but they're really great for hearts. They're, because they're transparent, you can actually just watch the heart. You don't have to do any wicked surgeries or anything like that. Uh, and you can do all sorts of great things. And interestingly, the, the embryos are viable. They don't even need a functional heart for the first five days because they're in water and they just get the, they get oxygen from the water. So you could have a cardiac dead fish, for, and it's still alive for the first five days. It's not very happy, but it's alive. And you know, let's face it, that's kind of hard to do with mice, but I know mice are cool moths. <laughs> so, but there's other practical things. They're really small, so you can have hundreds of them housed in the same space, you know, for one mouse. Uh, they grow quickly, get large numbers of progeny. You can get like 200 eggs per female. Uh, and then you can do all the cool cutting edge molecular biology techniques. So I'm going to talk about CRISPRs in a second. We can just do that with our, with our zebrafish. So here's the uh, experiment we want to do. We basically want to create a zebrafish that has a cardiovascular disease based on an actin mutation. So what we're going to do is a rescue um, experiment. We're going to knock out a zebrafish cardiac actin using CRISPRs. This zebrafish is unhappy. It has a cardiac phenotype. And then we're going to take those uh, CRISPR fish and we're going to cross them with another transgenic line that is expressing human cardiac actin in their hearts using transposon technology. And so we're basically asking, can the human cardiac actin rescue or at least partially rescue the cardiac phenotype that you see in this zebrafish cardiac actin knockout? And then the cool experiment is when you start crossing those CRISPR fish with 
zebrafish that are expressing the mutant cardiac actins and seeing if you can recapitulate the disease or something that looks like the disease. Fair enough? And so I'm going to just describe our progress, progress, American, Canadian, whatever, um, between making these transposon lines and the CRISPR lines. So to make a transposon line, you inject your embryos with some uh, transposase mRNA, your transposon construct, and then you start growing up the fish. We have a reporter in there. It's just GFP. And so when you first inject, not all the cells get the transposon, so you get sort of a patchwork. Some, cell, some spots are glowing, some aren't. And you grow those guys up. And you're hoping that someone in that group has got the germ line has the transposon in it too. And so then you start searching for a germ line founder and you cross that with a wild type fish and then some of your progeny then will look like this. They glow green because the reporter's in every cell and this particular fish now uh, has a transposon that is expressing that E99K mutant cardiac actin in its heart under the, under the um, CMLC um, cardiac myosin light chain promoter. So it's specific to the heart. So that's how we're making our transposon lines. We've been at this for about a year. We're starting to get some progress there. And then um, on the other side, we need to make these CRISPR lines too, right? And so the first thing you would do if you wanted to make CRISPRs is you got to go to your genome and figure out what gene you want to knock out and design your CRISPRs and away you go. Sounds really cool because zebrafish, the whole genome has been de de uh, determined, it's been sequenced, so sounds simple, right? Nothing is simple. We had to go back to the literature and go and figure out what, what actin genes in zebrafish are actually cardiac actin genes. Because as you know, when you sequence a genome, the first, um, <coughs> the first wave is just to let the computer figure out what the genes are. And when it comes to actin, I told you at the beginning, it's so highly conserved, it's the threshold for differences, it's way above what the computer can do. So you actually need a human brain to look at the sequences and go, based on my experience with actin, that looks like a cardiac actin. That looks like a skeletal actin. So that's what we had to do. Long story short, the paper's going to come out, I think, this year sometime. And then I can give you a talk specific about zebrafish actin. We think there are three cardiac actin uh, isoforms in zebrafish. This guy up here, CFK13. CFK stands for cardiofunk, so there is some literature about its effect. You can imagine what it is, cardiofunky. Uh, and the 13 it stands for the chromosome that it's on, chromosome 13. Uh, we think ACT C1A 1920 is also a cardiac actin. 1920, zebrafish, fish are ah, fun. Uh, they, for just for kicks when they're bored, they'll du duplicate their genome. Why not? Just for fun. So this particular gene is on chromosome 19 and an exact copy is on chromosome 20. So that makes it fun when you're designing CRISPRs. And then surprisingly, the, although the whole genome was sequenced, the computer missed an entire actin gene. Talk about disrespect. <laughs> um, and so this gene here, based solely on our understanding of sequence, because there's no biochemical data, there's no biology data, we think this other one is a cardiac actin too. So we've called it ACC one c And so just a couple of weeks ago, Maddie in the lab did some in situ hybridization experiments. And so the CFK13 is our control and you can see it shows up in the somites and in the heart here. So that's a, a, sort of a, a positive control. And then with the ACC one c we can see it in the heart and then also in what call, it's called the aortic arches on, on day two of development. And those aortic arches develop into the aorta. So we hypothesized that it was a cardiac actin based solely on sequence and now the in situ hybridization is essentially validating that we know what we're talking about. So we can go ahead now and start CRISPRing that guy too. I only have one slide to show you some CRISPR data. Again, trying to be respectful of time. Um, so we here's some um, phenotypes of a CRISPR. So on the left is a tubular heart. So this zebrafish heart, you can just see kind of moving back and forth here. Normally it starts as a tube and then about day one it, it twists 
and so you get the two chambers. But this one is developmentally delayed in its heart. So it's just a tubular heart. And the one on the, on the right is a fun video. So, it's, you know, squint. You see two fish. This guy here is normal, so its heart's beating away. This guy is, its heart's taking a coffee break right now. It's just doing nothing. And then eventually what you'll see is that heart coughs. It's, it goes, it pushes everything out in reverse, and then it starts going. There you go. Oh, there you go. It's like, and then let's go. <laughs> right? Right? So and I, I know you work with pets. Maybe not fish, though, right? So I don't know what we call that. But, uh, so there's definitely uh, cardi cardiac phenotypes that we see in these fish. And unfortunately, that's about as much time as I could. There's tons of movies with the zebrafish, and I can't show you all of them. So let's jump into the summary and future work. I hope you remember actin is a hub protein. You cannot mess with it because it interacts with everything. Uh, and then these different mutations, whoops, we think, lead to these different downstream effects. There's a strong compensatory mechanisms in our heart. Makes sense because we, as humans, live in every single environment. Our hearts need to be able to handle that. Uh, zebrafish have multiple actin isoforms. There's a new one that we've discovered, and I didn't have time to tell you about our discovery of a genetic program that seems to switch between isoforms during development. There seems to be kind of the equivalent of a fetal program and then sort of a more adult program, and they switch the isoform of the gene uh, around day two, day three. No time to talk about that. Um, but in the future, here, this is the Guelph Center. We're all together. It's a one big team. So we need your help. So I know some of you are doing ATPase assays, so we'd love to chat with you about how you do yours versus ours so we can optimize and get our assays working properly and then interpreted well uh, so that we're all on the same page. And then we're new to um, working with models, and I know some of you are working with mice, so we need some help. Help us do our immunolocalizations, doing histology some of the metabolism and physiology measurements. I'm working with uh, Todd Gillis's lab. They're, they have swimming tunnels for fish to measure like oxygen um, metabolism and so on. So I, we have a lot of potential within the center to do some really great collaborative work. And also, if you need anything purified, come talk to us, <laughs> right? If you are in your lab buying actin, please don't do that. <laughs> come talk to us. Our actin's better than their actin. <laughs> And then um, my last little bit, two minutes, is promotional. So here's my, my lab. Last uh, summer, we went to the Ride for Heart. I showed you the, the jersey. This was last year's jersey. Um, this year, the Ride for Heart is on June the 4th. It's a Sunday. Uh, Tammy went last year. It's a great time. You can talk to her. It's a wonderful event. I want you all to sign up for the Guelph Cardiovascular Team. I'm the captain. And love is helping organize this. Last year we had a team of around 10. And this year, if we can double that, we're going to get a lot more funding and a lot more uh, interest. We really want to promote the center, too, because um, we are treated as a VIP team because we're researchers. So we show up. It's the Guelph team. And then there's the whole Sick Kids team. There's the whole St. Mike's team. And then the gang from Guelph, right? So we need to show them. We're legit and we're gonna, you know, we can compete. <clears throat> so I really want you all to join. We're gonna have a, a kickoff event, so we're gonna send an email to everyone to, uh, for a 50-50 event to start our fundraising. The, we have a couple of months till the event, so if you sign up now, the research shows, you have a couple months to, you know, uh, speak it up and get people to go. As a VIP team, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> As a VIP team, here's the bad news. They want you to raise $1,000 each. Ooh! I know, I had the same reaction. Really? No, not going to happen. <laughs> but they recognize if we were a corporation, they'd insist it's 1000 bucks. And in fact, I don't know the TD Bank, they, how much they give. Because not only do they get the special jerseys, but their jerseys are green. And everyone else's is red. So they must give a lot of money. But as researchers, they're like, we want you to raise $1,000, but we recognize, you know, do the best you can. So we're trying to do that uh, this year as well and up the amount. You can do the bike ride, you can run, and you can do a walk with your family. And with that. And, and John, and it's not a race. And it's not a race, no. <laughs> no, you, and you get, again, you get the free jersey. It's really fun. And uh, you can get a medal and all this fun stuff. So please come. It's a lot of great, it's a good time. Thank you.